Good afternoon, welcome to Midday Live from our studios at Adisawe Kanda in Accra. I am Stephen N.T. In our headlines this afternoon, 1,898 persons recover for COVID-19 in Ghana with case count of 6,269. And elsewhere, a two-day-old baby dies from coronavirus in South Africa after being born premature to a coronavirus-positive mother. We have all these stories plus the very uh, latest in sports, business and international news coming up over the next hour. Now, since the outbreak of COVID-19, the World Health Organization has recommended increased testing for early detection of the virus. Here in Ghana, calls are increasing for government to institute measures for voluntary testing. Grace Amwasari has been finding out the preparedness of Ghanaians and government. Testing for COVID-19 has become very essential, especially in times where there are many numbers of asymptomatic cases and Ghana is no exception. Since the outbreak of COVID-19 in Ghana, our case count has been on the high and government has attributed this to the multiple testing being done. The other part of the question is whether we shouldn't be opening up for voluntary testing and does the country have the capacity to open up for voluntary testing. Some Ghanaians express their preparedness for voluntary testing. Once I live in Accra, and Accra has almost the highest number of positive um, patients, why not? Because during the day, we, we go through a lot of activities with other people. Me, for once, like I pick trotter almost every day from the house to the work and back. So if there is a chance like that, why not? It's good you know your stance, your status, so that you don't spread there's um, a virus, yeah. So that, that's why you should voluntarily get tested so that you know your status, you can protect yourself and then the people around you. You have to go and see your status, if you have it or not. So why not? I will go for testing. That will help me know my status so that I'll be more careful when I'm out or when I'm in, uh, coming in contact with any other person. But the Ghana Health Service says currently there's no voluntary testing nationwide. If we should permit this, most workers, employers will say that I want all my staff to be tested. How is the country, the laboratory resource going to cope with this? This will bring undue pressure on the lab and the backlog that we have struggled to clear very soon to come back. So voluntary testing it's not part of the protocol and you cannot cope with it for now. For many experts, it will be prudent for government to institute measures for voluntary testing to help with early detection and prevention. We already have a lot of people in, in, in the public, you know, amongst us who have the virus, but because we are not testing everybody, we still don't know how many people we have. What we have right now is from the enhanced contact tracing and other things that have been done. If you add the voluntary testing, of course, the numbers will increase and it's, it's normal. Virologist Eugene Arthur, however, fierce government might not be able to introduce mass voluntary testing, though it's been rolled out in some regions. If we're going to consider um, this voluntary testing, we have to know how we get people on board to do this. We need to get a psychologist involved, we need to get um, you know, some education around it. So when we do it, people will understand why we are doing it. Well. It appears a lot will need to be done to open up the country for voluntary testing because people tell me they are ready to walk into any health centre and test for COVID-19. Grace Hamua Asari, TV2 News, Accra. And uh, with 587 cases of COVID-19 recorded in Obwasi, the mining town is yet to record new 
positive cases. Two batches of samples processed at the uh, Kumasi Center for Collaborative uh, Research proved negative. William Evans Income is joining us on Skype uh, with a perspective uh, on the current outlook of 918 cases in the region. Uh, Ms. Enkum, how are you, sir? Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, it's good news that uh, so far Obwasi has not recorded any new case. I want to find out from you uh, what the Ghana Health Service says is the reason why there is no new case. So, it has to do with strict adherence to the safety protocols, which the people of Obwase is holding in high esteem. For instance, if you go to the main hotspot, that is the Obwase Municipal uh, Central Market, every single person that I saw on that particular, in that particular place had the face uh, or nose mask on. Aside that, the Veronica Bucket have also been placed at vantage position just to ensure regular hand washing and all of that, with sanitizers also readily available for the people there. So I am not surprised that um, they are, they, they've kind of stabilized as far as their um, case count is concerned. For instance, on the 18th of May, 64 samples were taken and none tested positive for COVID. Then on the 20th, another 26 samples taken, none tested positive for the COVID. With, even with the 918 cases currently recorded in the Ashanti region, since 18, Obwase Municipal has still remained at 381 with only a death. Um, Obwase East has also remained 206 with no death. So since 18, there hasn't been any increase in tally as far as their case count is concerned. However, if you go to a place like Adanse South, they have added one more case to their tally. So in on in 18th or on 18th, Adanse South had recorded three cases, but now they have four cases. Adanse North still remain unchanged. One case, there hasn't been any addition. Amancia Central, there hasn't been any addition um, as far as their case count is concerned. And of course, Acrofoam is also yet to record any case, even though they are the closest as far as proximity and then as far as the district surrounding Obwase is concerned, Steve. So, Ms. Angum, I, I, I want to take a look at the overall outlook of the Ashanti region. You just told us uh, the, the numbers in, in the region overall. So, if we take the situation in Obwasi and we compare to the regional-wide outlook, uh, what are you gathering about the rates, uh, whether the cases are stabilizing or, I should use the most popular phrase, whether we are reaching a peak in Ashanti region? If somebody tells me we are reaching a peak as far as the latest figures are concerned, then I will agree with that particular person because for some time now, we are not increasing any significant numbers as far as cases for COVID-19 is concerned. Don't forget that only two days ago, we were hovering around 886. Now we have 918. And not all the administrative districts have upped their figures. And among the 25 administrative districts that have recorded cases, as far as the Ashanti region is concerned, there hasn't been any new case from anywhere. So let me just run you through the cases so that you have a better understanding of what I'm talking about. So 918 cases for now, 32 new cases as of yesterday, no death. So within the last couple of days, we haven't recorded any data aside the last count, um, which pegged the rate at seven. We haven't recorded any addition as far as death is concerned. Now, recoveries. We have the second repeat negative, and technically, that is what is settled as recovery. The first repeat negative, since there's another test that has to run to confirm the, 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 the recovery level, it is normally not added. So technically, we still have 87 um, recoveries out of the 918. They are still waiting to run another test on 139 um, to ascertain whether they, we can still um, consider them as total recovery. So we are technically, we have 87, even though the first repeat negative is still around 139. Now, home-based care has shot up, and I'm not surprised because the last time 
We were mm. talking about 706. So there has been 28 addition. You just deduct that from the number of cases that we have recorded. And you understand that these are mild symptoms. So 734 at the moment, they are still being managed from the home. I think it's good news. Now, let's talk about the ratio. I mean, or I mean, the percentages as far as female, uh, 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 female and then male populations are concerned. So 481 females have contracted mm. or have tested positive for the virus, which represent 52% of the population. Then 437 males um, representing 48% have tested for the virus. So um, the females continue to lead as far as cases in the Ashanti region is concerned. But Stephen, let's look at the cases and deaths. I think it is quite interesting because zero and nine, I mean, we're talking about the age brackets. Zero and nine, we have one death. 10 and 19, we have one death. 20 and 29, we have one death. And that's the highest number of cases because here we are talking about over 220 cases hmm. in that age bracket. Then 30 and 39 is the, constitute the second highest. Um, they have recorded the highest number of cases as far as that, that, that age bracket is concerned, but nobody has died. 40 and 49, there hasn't been any death. 50 and 59, they, there's one death. 60 and 69, there's one death. 70 and 79, there's one death. And then 80 plus, one death. So adding all these together, tallying them, totaling seven deaths recorded in the Ashanti region. Stephen. Right, Mr. Nkum, thank you very much uh, for that uh, breakdown. We're grateful for your time. Uh, Williams Evans Nkum is our man from Ashanti region giving us uh, up to date with the overall figures in the region. Now, 187,929 coronavirus tests have so far been conducted in Ghana. Out of that, 6,269 uh, have tested uh, positive uh, to COVID-19 and uh, have some of have recovered. Uh, recovery so far being 1,898. Uh, we, the minister, the director of the Ghana Health Service has been addressing the media on these, these figures. As at the last we presented, yeah, between the 8th and the 19th of May, a total of 170 new cases has been recorded in Ghana. 46 of these cases have come from Accra, 6 from Eastern Region. Central has recorded 27 new cases. Western Region also increased by 59 cases and followed by Ashanti with 35 new cases. At the same period, we also recorded an additional 144 recoveries since the last update. And so the total count for recoveries now stands 1,898, bringing our recovery rate to about 30.2%. But I must let you know that we have a large pool of people waiting for a second test. And I believe that in the next few days, the new numbers will be added. This has come out of, so, okay, let me get back. So our total cumulative count of cases from the first to the last now is 6,269 cases with 39, 31 deaths. In the same period of now, we've done about 187,929 tests, 49,661 coming from routine surveillance, and another 138,000 plus coming from the enhanced contact tracing. We have so far recorded 31 deaths, as you have seen on the website. Of this number, Eight of them are over 65 years, 65 and more. We have three who are under 20, mainly nine, six, among other things. Greater Accra accounts, obviously, account for the larger number of deaths, accounting for about 20 out of the 31 that have come from Greater Accra, especially when we look at the fact that about 80, close to 90 percent of our cases.
This is still midday live from our studios at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. Now, an audit report into the sustainability of sports stadiums in Ghana has concluded that the National Sports Authority and the Ministry of uh, youth and sports have not done enough to maintain sports stadiums in Ghana and manage them on a sustainable basis. The audit into the Ministry of Youth and Sports and National Sports Authority was conducted from August 2017 to December 2018 and covered the period of 2012 to 2018. The Auditor General asked the National Sports Authority to refund 180,000 uh, 494 used for the 2017 National Sports Festival to the management of the Babayara Sports Stadium for the replacement of broking uh, seats. I've been joined in the studio by uh, Bernard Kundia, Assistant Public uh, uh, Relations Officer of the Audit Service, uh, joining us. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for your time. So I want to have an, uh, a fair idea. The audit found out that all five major stadia did not have any uh, operations and maintenance manual for the contractors of the various stadia. I want you to uh, clarify what exactly this means. Okay. Thank you and good afternoon to our viewers. Thanks for the opportunity also. The audit, basically, the performance audit, not the financial audit, mm. a performance audit, mm. was to assess the operations of National Sports Authority and the Ministry of Youth and Sports. And we, the audit focused on three issues. The oversight responsibility of the ministry, the maintenance of the stadiums, mm. stadia across the country, and then the revenue generation and control of control mechanisms mm. that the, the NSA has in place. One of the key documents needed to manage a stadium is a manual, the operational and maintenance manual. The operational manuals enabled the managers, particularly the estate officers and the other officers tasked to supervise the operation of the stadium mm. to follow a lay down procedure. So it, it tells you when to fix what. The maintenance manual helps you to know when and which material to use in maintaining the stadium. Remember, a place like Accra Sports Stadium is close to the sea, which tells you that it, 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 there will be corrosion over time. And so the manual tells you to do regular maintenance and at what intervals. So these were some of the things the audit brought out, that these documents were not there. And so it made it difficult for managers to know when to do what. And that led to the stadium deteriorating. Mm, so uh, we also know that the National Sports Authority and the uh, management of the five city have put in place measures to ensure that the commercial facilities are put to maximum use uh, to generate this income. I mean, contrasting that with the fact that uh, some of the, uh, you know, the report says that uh, the National Sports Authority is expected to refund some 180,494 uh, for the National Sports Festival to the management of the Bavaria Sports Center. A lot of money uh, is required to sustain maintenance also. So how do uh, these uh, National Sports Authority manage with the, these situations? Well, for this particular around 80,000, as part of a money, a fine that the managers of the Kumasi Sports mm. Stadium, the Bavaria Sports Stadium, charged Ghana Education Service, because when they organize a sports festival, some student went into some form of uh, fight and they broke uh, some seats. And so they charged them and they paid this money for the seats to be fixed. Unfortunately, uh, the sports authority misapplied this money to, to another activity. Instead of fixing the, the chairs at the, st at the stadium, they rather use it to organize another sports festival. So the auditor general is saying that since that money was paid by GES for the purpose of fixing the chairs that were broken, it is incumbent on the, on the National Sports Authority to refund the money so that these chairs could be fixed for users of the stadium to have a full benefit. Mm. In terms of resources, the stadium has other facilities like gyms, they have restaurants, they have clinics. In fact, if you go to... Uh, 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 a and then Tamale, they even have 40 bed capacity hostels. Even though currently this, uh, they are, they've not been completed. It is only um, the Cape Coast Stadium that has been completed. If these facilities are 
put to use, definitely they will generate income. When we talk of advertising, it is one way of generating income for every organization. You look at Metro Mass, they are using uh, 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 their buses for people to put, put their bills there, and they generate income. The stadium has vast space that could be used for advertising. All these things are not happening. If the clinics are active, all the, these five stadia have clinics. If they are active, they are going to generate funds for the, the NSA to maintain the facilities. Remember, if you want to wait for three, four, five years, like we did with, the, with the Accra and Kumasi Stadia, waiting for over eight years, definitely the money that you require to renovate the whole facility, it, it might build another one. Mm. But if you are doing regular maintenance of these facilities annually, you realize that the cost of maintaining them wouldn't be so much. And remember, we are now building new sports facilities across the country. This, uh, 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 how do you call it? The sports centers that the Ministry of Youth and Sports are building in, in the regional capitals. If we go in with the same attitude, these facilities, as laudable as the idea is, will not last. I, the last I, time, the, I, mini mm. the minister said they have yeah. released $3 million to fix the Esipon Stadium just about two weeks ago. Probably if we're doing that regular maintenance, wouldn't need that huge amount. But, but, but as you talk about uh, regular maintenance, uh, there are concerns that auditing into uh, the management of uh, the National Sports Council and uh, for its facilities uh, delayed. So from the audit service, this report was, uh, this audit was conducted uh, between December 2017 to December 2018, covering a period as far back as 2012. Why uh, does the audit service not do periodic auditing uh, like a ye yearly? Because covering 2012 to 2018, that's a period of six years. Thank you. For performance, unlike financial audit, that is annual, mm. performance is driven by subject matters. So if an issue comes up, that is of national in nature. Mm. The team will pick it up and do what we call a pre-study. So this particular audit was necessitated by media agitations that our stadia are deteriorating to the extent that our Crossport Stadium at a point the VIP was completely blocked mm. because ASL advised the ministry that considering how the place has deteriorated, if they keep using it, it could collapse and kill people. And so these were the issues that triggered it. And for, for performance audit, Anytime we go in, we want to go back and do what we call a trend analysis to see is it a, a one-off thing or it is something that has been happening so that we can recommend a permanent kill. And that is why we always look back five years, six years to see whether the situation is just a one-off incident mm. or it is something that has persisted over time, which then gives us an idea that no, this thing needs attention interesting and uh, i know that you have uh, made recommendations we just spoke about your recommendations that uh, the uh, national sports council should put to use some of the uh, facilities they have including advertisement etc but i want to find out from you going forward what other recommendations have you made uh, for the management of all of these uh, various sports stadia across ghana to uh, make them more beneficial to the people well we did recommend to national sports authority to develop a business plan for their facilities. Apart from the field, there are other facilities that can help them generate funds. There are no plans, there are no strategies to manage them or to generate income to help sustain their, their, their existence. And the more they deteriorate, the higher the cost of maintaining them. And these facilities are facilities that we need as a nation to help develop sports. Remember, sports is now big business. We also recommended that where they lack the capacity to manage them, they can lease these facilities out to other private entities or partner them. These days, government is talking about PPP. So partner these private entities to manage some of these facilities, like the car parks, like the clinics, like the restaurant, the gym, and, and what have you, to generate funds. One thing that also came out was the renting of shops. There were no records. So again, we have recommended that they should get 
records of the tenancy agreements and where there are no tenancy agreement for shops that the stadium managers or NAC has leased out, they should. And where necessary, they should even go back and get monies. Because once you rent out a facility to a tenant, that tenant is supposed to pay something. And I must commend the, the managers of the uh, Babayara Stadium. Because during the audit, we realized that that was the only team that has taken this uh, uh, rent issue to court. Because they realized that there were no records indicating how much these people are to pay. And they were not actually paying anything to them. And when they went to get monies, they said, well, they had already paid the money, but there were no records to show. And so they had to take the matter to court. So we are saying that record keeping is equally important. Mm. If you look at the, the hostels also, we have recommended that the NSA should collaborate with the ministry to complete these hostels. Apart from being renting them out, they could also be used by team, national teams or clubs that even go there to uh, uh, either play football matches or partake whatever activity. And then that will also generate income for the National right. Sports Authority. Right, Mr. Kodia, we're grateful for your time. Thank you extremely uh, for joining us. Uh, Bernard Kondia is Assistant Public Relations Officer of the Ghana Audit Service. This is still midday live from our studios at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. And remember, you can catch us live on DSTV Channel 279. We're streaming on Facebook and on 3news.com. Now, the founding president of the Worldwide Miracle Outreach, Dr. Lauren Stetter, says a compilation of a new voters register has become a thorn in the flesh of the nation because there is no consensus. According to him, the chairperson, Madame Jean Mensah, should brace herself for more personal attacks, but says she should do what is right for the nation. My colleague Nancy Vukania spoke with the man of God. Right, uh, we apologize. Uh, we will have to bring you that story uh, much later. This is still midday live from our studios at Addis Kanda in Accra. Welcome back. Uh, we well, apologize uh, for the uh, technical hitches earlier, but uh, founding president of the Worldwide Miracle Outreach, uh, Dr. Lauren Stetter, says that the compilation of a new voters register has become a thorn in the flesh of the nation because there is no consensus. According to him, the chairperson, Jean Mensah, should brace herself up for more personal attacks, but says she should do what's right for the nation. My colleague Nancy Vukanir spoke with him. Do you personally think that it's necessary for us to have a new voters' role? The question is, as a nation, what do we want? We shouldn't play cheap politics. We should play matured politics. We have a big challenge, and the challenge we have in Ghana is that anything done by NDC is ugly in the eyes of MPP, and anything done by MPP is ugly in the eyes of NDC. So there's no concession plan. So there's no succession plan. And that is why we are having this problem we are having. Do you see us having an election in December this year? Why not? What prevents us from election? If things are done right and everything go right. Nancy, leadership comes with attack. If you're a leader like we are, you definitely get, don't you, you think I don't get attacks? When I said the president should reconsider his stand on the churches, and my intention was that he should get a small group of people that will be praying, you should see the attacks I got. When I said, God, we should continue to build a cathedral, you should see the attacks I got. So she should, she's welcome to the club. My father taught me one thing before he died. My father said there are two groups of people you can never impress. Your friends who love you for what you are and your enemies that are never satisfied with what you do right. So my father said, learn to do the right thing. So when people judge you and they accuse you and they bastardize you, your, you in your conscience will know you've done the right thing. As a matter of fact, Jane Mensa, the EC chair, should just do what is right in the sight of God, 
not in the sight of man, and God will vindicate her. Uh, the public health advocate has taxed government to resource NGOs in the health sector to help in the public education on COVID-19. Oreka Tete said such approach will help in the fight against the virus. He's been speaking to correspondent Ibrahim Abubakar. With COVID-19, what I've realized is that when you look at the national framework, right down to the district, it will interest you to know that the NGOs have a role to play. But I, what I've observed is that uh, NGOs are not being involved now. Because if you look at the community sensitization and then education, it is the key role of the NGOs. So this is the time government should resource NGOs, especially the Ghana Coalition of NGOs in Health. We are in every region, in every district in Ghana. This is where our, our, our role is very much needed. If you remember, during the period of the HIV and AIDS, look at the key role NGOs play in terms of a community sensitization and education. And it worked very, very, very well, perfectly. Why should the government resource you instead of resourcing the likes of NCC and ISD to educate the public with regards to this pandemic? We can go right to the community level, all right? So when we, and then we live with the communities and they, they know us better. They understand us better. We understand the, the language we speak, the, the language they also speak. You see, for instance, if we have videos of uh, what is happening all over the world and it's being shown every evening at every uh, vantage point and locations, I'm telling you the, the lackadaisical like, attitude of Ghanaians towards this uh, COVID-19. Uh, look at the, 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 what do you call it, the, 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 the social distance, it's not being practiced. Uh, the, the, the wearing of masks, it's not being at the head. Do you see it? People are saying they haven't seen, uh, what do you call it, uh, anybody who has suffered from COVID-19 before. So if these videos are being shown from the U.S., from, uh, uh, what do you call it, China, and uh, Spain, and Italy, and all these things, I think that it, it, it's going to, uh, you know, put some sort of fear. The Ghanaian needs fear, Masa. If we leave it that way, then I think uh, continuously people, uh, more people will be infected with the uh, COVID-19. That was Mr. Oraka Tete, a public health advocate and also the former um, Ashanti Regional Director for Coalition of NGOs in Health Services. He's calling on the government to resource NGOs so that they will send the message down the grounds for people to be really aware and educated about this COVID-19. Ibrahim Awuwakar, TV3, Kumasi. And the Akrima uh, Kwanwuma District Assembly has instituted a number of measures to curb the spread of COVID-19 in the district. Hawkers along the Ahenema Kokobing Obwasi stretch now operate a shift system to reduce congestion. Correspondent Beatrice Spielgabra uh, speaks with the local authorities and traders on the effectiveness of the measures to curb an upsurge of COVID-19. <laughs> Akrima Kwanwuma has recorded 30 cases out of the 886 cases that the region has of the confirmed COVID-19 cases. We are here in the offices of the District Chief Executive to speak to him as to what measures the Assembly has been taking so that the 30 cases, if they do not scale up, at least they will reduce the infections that they are having. Now, I think about 5,000 5, people that is ongoing. So that's why you're seeing the number going up. Because the more you test the people, the more you get these uh, uh, cases. And I also know that you have about eight or ten recoveries out of this. We have done some jingles on pen drives given to the information centers. So that every morning, after an evening, they play it on the information centers to alert the people that this thing is rare. And also, uh, even this morning, uh, we, uh, we sent uh, this uh, news mask to some of our revenue uh, checkpoints so that those people come in, the, the drivers, the taxi drivers and the uh, total drivers, they can check them and give it to them. As you also come in, looking around, most of your people were not with their nose marks. Are there any efforts to scale up the wearing of the nose marks? 
You know, this is uh, one of the problems you are facing now. Well, when we meet somebody and ask about the nose man, they say that they will tell that they, they can't even breathe. But no, this is about protecting yourself. But you so, uh, last, I think last week, the regional minister, the uh, rector came out with the policy that uh, if you don't wear nose mask, you will not be sent to court, but you will be asked to sleep and uh, do something like that. We're going to ask the police to go. You have a task force too. They are, they are going out to see, to put this measure. But when you pass through the animal cabin, uh, formerly we see, uh, had a lot of uh, hawkers there, people selling water, bread and the rest. Now, uh, last week, you put a stop to that. But this week, you are giving them cuts that do not all come down at the same time. You have about, in groups, about four groups. So to reduce the number. Because you see, from Ahima Okobin, from Obuasi and other districts, they all pass to Ahima Okobin. So if you have these problems in other districts coming to Ahima Okobin, that's where they buy the food and the rest. They put the money in their pocket. And if the money is infected, definitely it's affected. And that's why we are doing all these things there. You heard me speak with the district chief executive, Nana Ochre Teria. I'm here at Ahima Okobin. Ahunima Kokoben is one of the hot spots, especially if you, ha you have to move in into Obwasi or when you are coming out. A lot of trading activities also goes on here. This is what the DC told us, that they have reduced the number of traders by giving them these cards. So if you don't have a special card, you cannot trade here. They have been giving the day one, day two to day five, so that every day a number of traders will come here to hawk. I have one of the leaders of the Hawkers Association within the district, how they are enforcing uh, traders or the Hawkers so that anyone who is not supposed to trade on a specific day will not come. I have a lot of people who are not going to be able to do this. I have a lot of people who are not going to be able to do this. I have a lot of people who are not going to be able to do this. As you say, on the Amea and the Sanese, Yaliana Ban, or Bossa to keep more than best of four hundred cases. And you know, you see, you say, Yan Yan, she said a bear and Tamon Nipano so better, and the Ian she say, and the Sawyer de Wire, Uba de Wire, they two, or some of you, you should be a day two. There's still, this is still midday live from our studios at the Sawi Kanda. Up next is sports with Yao of Osul Lavi. Hello, good afternoon. It's time to do sports here on Media Live on TV. Now, Kumasi Santiago Toko CEO George Amaku says the lack of competitive environment has left the club financially bruised. In an interview with TV3, he speaks on the struggle the club has had to endure during this period. Traffic. Even when you're playing your football matches every Sunday, day in, day out, you cannot meet your costs. You always have to rely on the benevolence of other people to be able to run your club. Now that you cannot earn anything, it becomes very, very, very serious and very difficult to manage. We have, we have had to negotiate with our players to agree to cut their salaries by 30%. Even that, it's, it's not easy to meet. It affects sponsorship uh, monies. Uh, with some of our sponsors, the deal is very simple. When you are in a situation like this, force majeure, they would not pay you the money. They pay monies to link it up with the mileage they will get from your playing football. And if you are not playing football, they are not in a position to pay you any monies. And that is the period in which we find ourselves. We are not getting sponsorship monies paid. So no money is coming from nowhere. And it is extremely difficult for us. Extremely difficult. Well, that's all the sports news this afternoon here on Midday Live on TV3. My name is Yao of Usulab International News. Is up next. Welcome back. Now, world-renowned reggae musician Everton Blender says the current lifestyle of some reggae and dancehall artists
pushed the youth into armed robbery and quick money-making ventures. The popular musician known in real life as Everton Dennis Williams spoke to Black Cobby on the Reggae Vibe show on 3FM. Now go broke cause the color of my skin Now go cheap because me want to win the legendary reggae artist who has been in the reggae fraternity for over 40 years said unlike the good content they produced in the 70s that focused on culture, Africa and the unity of black people, the current youth who are into reggae are focusing on wealth which they do not only sing about but display in their videos. Speaking in a telephone interview with the RTP Best Reggae Show host of the year 2019 Black Hobby, on the Reggae Vibe Show on 3FM, Everton Blender admonished the youth going into reggae not to focus on material things in your days it wasn't all about money yes um, right now right now we never used to you know but we should, we should have to can make money now so we make to make some money when we can but right now most of the time you know people don't love culture they like the blending song everton blender is known worldwide for his popular uplifting song lift up your head get to people song and brain food which features anthony b to his credit lift up your head and hold it up And that's how we'll wrap up with the news on this reggae note. I'm Stephen N.T. Thank you very much for hanging out with us for the past hour. And we have the crew here. Good afternoon. There is more news at 3news.com.